Hey everybody, how is it going? It is your pal, Sal here. Happy Wednesday and welcome back to my share discography journey today. I, we are, we're tackling, we're doing the big one. This is the one, this is the fan favorite. It's my favorite too. So newsflash, this is the first share album we are tackling where I literally know every song. I was introduced to this album many years ago and it has stuck with me since. Today we are talking about her 12th studio album which was released on April 19th of 1975. Just celebrated its 46th anniversary. Stars. This this album, I was introduced to it um, many moons ago. I was gifted a copy of the vinyl. This is not that same vinyl. That one unfortunately got destroyed in, uh, in a flood, but I've since gotten a new copy of it. Um, this is an album that is truly a turning point in Cher's career. So just as a little up to snuff like type of things, um, basically Cher ended the Sonny and Cher comedy hour, divorced Sonny, kicked his ass out, um, and was hanging, I forget exactly the precise circumstances around it, but was around a lot of um, up and coming, really talented musical acts, such as Janis Joplin and whatnot. Uh, and she was very inspired to create an album that was much more like that, a little less campy, just more serious and that is what resulted in this album uh it is an album that is shockingly full of all covers considering she wanted to really you know branch out of things she it's all covers on here um like i said i was introduced to this many years ago and i just i it was basically because of the i knew i obviously know her song love hurts and uh, i didn't know that she had like another recording of it from this album it was the first time she tackled the song and uh i was all about it and then because of that i listened to that album i've actually done a video already on this album it wasn't a reaction but it's a video called share hit a whistle note once. Um, if you want, you can go check that out on my channel. Uh, we'll talk about that more in detail as we get to that particular song. Um, so basically, Cher was on a new label, Warner Brothers Records, which is the label that she's on today. She's gone through a few in between, but she's <laughs> from here back to them. Uh, and the other thing that's very specific, especially with this era that we're about to go through, through basically the mid 70s to the early 80s, these albums, especially this one, have never been released on CD or any form of digital media. In fact, the only way you could get the CD is a bootleg. This isn't even the official bootleg. This is a bootleg of the bootleg. I mean, oh, wait, hang on. Okay, I can't. <laughs> See, look at that. <laughs> uh, so you can't get it on CD anywhere. Um, it's never been reissued. The quote that has always popped up online about this album as to why it's never been released is basically that Cher owned the album's master rights and Warner had no right to reissue. I've heard a couple people say that that isn't even true, but uh, I don't know. Uh, Cher, if you ever see this, it's time. Get this out on, on CD, um, Spotify, Apple Music. The world needs to hear this. This is honestly an album that I love. It's filled with such amazing vocals, such amazing songs. In fact, in preparation for this week, I made a playlist of all the original songs. Did not notice um, that they uh, all basically are not that different from the originals, but uh, I think the best thing to do is just we gotta get started. We gotta talk about this album track by track. So we're gonna begin with track number one, which is the opening, Love Enough. Here we go. And also I should say, even though you can't get this on... Um, Vine or CD or digitally, it's on YouTube. I mean, it's pretty easy. I have my own rip of it from the CD with a few bonus tracks that we'll tackle. Um, so we begin uh, with track number one. This is Love Enough. Let's do it. That instrumental is just so gorgeous. I mean, oh. Uh... Something goes wrong. Either punishes or strokes our pride in our summer. Ah, the fight let go of It's so pretty. Something comes up, something goes down. But if we ever get our minds made up, here we go back to those minds made up. Your name before you're in this game, but baby, I'm not 
Come on, come on. Okay, um, before I get started, I missed two of my stats that I usually say at the beginning. The um, album did chart at the Billboard 200 at number 153. Not great. And uh, there was only one single, which was Geronimo's Cadillac, which did not chart. Shocking to me that that was the only single, but uh, we'll talk about that more as the time goes on. With Love Enough, this song is only a taste of what is to come on this album. I mean, the gist of it is like... In the darkest times, and the darkest troubles, if we just love enough, we can make it through, we can see it through. Um, Cher's vocal is so great that the production is just so <laughs> gorgeous. Um, I, I love this song. But like I said, it's only just a little taste of what's about to come on this album. Um, it, you know, uh, the genre that this is described as, um, right here, where was it? Blues rock. I was going to say, this album also does kind of have like a sense of psychedelicness to it. Um, not, not... It's light. It's light. Very li It's li diet psychedelic. <laughs> but there's hints of it in there. Um, it feels very um, almost futuristic. Like you're kind of like, or it almost feels like you're in another world in a sense. It's maybe what a lot of people consider a better way of uh, production-wise from Bittersweet White Light. Um, especially because Sonny had. This is the first album where Sonny had nothing to do. Granted, he was not really a part of the other ones, but he was still like around. He was nowhere near this. Um, and it just shows, oh, it just shows how much she's evolved so far. But yeah, love enough, gorgeous, but just, just a taste of what's coming. Track number two, Bell Bottom Blues. And also, come on, this song, that title, so 70s. I'd be so tall if I was in the 70s with Bell Bottoms, because I'm already 6'1", so, oh, I would have been here for it. Tall and skinny! Bell Bottom Blues, you made me cry. Oh, this is where it gets a little psychedelic. I forgot. It's so real. It's so raw. I mean, the emotion on this song is is bar none. It's it's so good. Again, the title is so 70s bell-bottom blues, but realistically, 
me being, you know, I'm 24 in May, May 3rd of 2021, um, I still can relate to this. Um, I, it, 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 she's just begging this man. She's begging, please don't leave me. Please just take me with you. Like, come on, like, please. I mean, the, I mean, if you could just, you could replace Bell Bottom with anything. Um, sad, sad blues. It, it's not really about the Bell Bottom blues. Um, it's about just being blue. Um, I love it. The emotion on her voice. What I didn't realize, especially with her more airy notes here, it's very indicative of when she would tackle um, one by one, and which I can't, oh, I can't wait to talk about that. Sneak peek. That's my favorite share song. Um, in the "It's a Man's World" album, uh, it's it's uh, this. Oh, oh. I think she's also now. The funny thing about this album is that, I, believe me, I've done my fair share of research on it, and uh, the um, live performance. I I think. She's done this live. Now, for a record, all of the performances that are from this album, and there's only a few, because she didn't really go all out to... Yeah, she did do it live. They're all, um, uh, what's the word? Um, lip synced. Um, let, let me double check this one right here. Wait. That sounds a little different than the studio. Is this one not lipped? We'll talk about that later. Maybe I regret what I said, and maybe I didn't do my research properly, but that, that sounded a little live. Hang on, either way. Either, the other song I know for a fact is left, so there's that. But um, uh, Bell Bottom Blues, gorgeous, loves it. Um, so good. That could have been a single. Like, it, it could have. It really could have. Let's keep it going. Track number three, These Days. Oh, this is where she does the little hum. I don't know these lyrics as well. Okay, that was These Days, and I'm going to be quite frank, I never really paid too much attention to the lyrics on this one. I don't know why, but I feel like my eyes were just opened wide on this one. So, I've always liked this one. Uh, it's it's a very slow point in the album, but I feel like it's very reflective in the... Ba -da 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 -da. I love that part. That that Because well, the song doesn't really have a chorus. I guess that's the closest thing it has to a chorus. Um, but uh, what what you really get in this song is that this lady that Cher is portraying has seen some shit. She's gone through it all. She's been in love, out of love. And now she's like, you know what? These days, I just, I don't see the worth in it. Like, I don't know what she knows. Very, I, I relate to that hardcore. But um, it... Like, I love this part right here where she's like, now I'll keep on moving. Lord, things are bound to be improved in these days. One of these days, I'll sit on corner stones. But then this lyric at the end really got me. It was like, my sweet friend, please don't confront me with my failures. And she repeats this three times. I've not forgotten them. Like, she's like, I know, I know, I get it. Um, it's very melancholy. And it's, it's, it's very sad. It's kind of like in this weird spot. But it's, I mean, gorgeous as always. And her delivery is great. I mean, especially with everything she had been through up in that stage of the game with Sunny. I mean, she... Because I think she was already in another relationship at this point. She was never, she was never one to be shy with the men. But um, yeah, we love these days. Amen, baby. 
Okay, track number four picks up the pace a little bit. This is Mr. Soul. Oh. Oh. Okay, that was Mr. Soul, and I'm gonna be honest, if I'm correct, so I was looking at the track list, this album only has 10 songs, all of which I do know. I can't picture for the life of me how Rock and Roll Doctor goes, so we're gonna have to wait till that one comes up, because I'm like, I was looking at that, I'm like, how does that one go? But I would argue that this one is probably my least favorite of the album. It works, it gives the album a little pep in its step, because like I said, it's quite a, it's quite a somber, more, more I would say melancholy album. Um, but, uh, it's fun. I mean, definitely, I could definitely see Cher belting it out live. Um, but it just doesn't do a whole lot for me. I like that it gives, like I said, it gives her a little sexiness to it. But uh, if they had maybe not chosen to put it on the album, which I'm not saying, because it's only 10 tracks, I'm not mad about that. But it's probably, I would argue, my least favorite. But when Rock and Roll Doctor comes up, we'll, we'll talk about that then. But just so you know. Okay, we have the end of side A. We have track number five. We have just this beautiful masterpiece. Just this one time. You know what this is. Yeah. We know what's coming. Oh, okay, we gotta wait for it. We know it's coming. You know it's coming. You know it home. And if you don't know what's coming, hold up, hold up. Okay. Okay, so that was just this one time. Um, if you really want a complete like analysis of uh, everything about this, I recommend you check out that full video that's just dedicated to this song, specifically uh, the note. Um, but uh, you know, it's on my channel. It's called "Share Hit a Whistle Note Once." You can't miss it. Um, this song, I will never ever forget the first time I heard it, and I was just playing it on my Crosley record player, and I hear that that godly note and I was like what the hell was that 
Um, in that, in this song, Cher hits an F6. Now, I've heard a lot of people argue that this is not a whistle note, and it's also not a note. It's a frequency is what she's hitting because it's not part of her range. I don't really give a shit. As far as I'm concerned, Cher just hit a whistle. She was Shariah Carey for this brief interlude of this song. It, this song, I mean, even if it didn't have that whistle note, it would still be just as gorgeous because her belt and her drive in it is just perfect. But that note, it just proves that she's capable of so many things. And I mean, could this have ever been a sustainable part of her range? I don't think so. But the fact that she went out of her way and did it, now granted, this was a, probably a one and done take. Um, but it sounds so good. Like, it sounds much better than you think it would. Like, it sounds right. It sounds real. It sounds perfect. Um, I, I, and I remember, too, uh, when I was in college, I'd be like, did you guys know? Like, I had friends. We were talking about Sherman and I'm like, did you know she hit a whistle note once? And they were like, yeah, right. And I p popped this on my phone, and I was like... <laughs> and they were like, everyone is shocked whenever they hear that. It's, it's so good. I, I mean, we gotta... Even though, what, this is, album is 46 years old, share... That still deserves an applause to this very day. Um, it's a perfect song. And what I didn't realize really until this sitting right here is that it's kind of a sequel to, um, what, what, what's the song's name? I just forgot it. These Days, because in that one, she's like, I just don't see the point in it anymore. And in this one, she's like, okay, I gotta give it a try. Come on, you gotta just give me just this one time. I really need you to be here for me. Um, it's beautiful. It's so gorgeous. Ah, oh, okay, let's listen to that note one more time. Shall we? <laughs> Just one more time for the road. For the road, baby. Ah! And especially when she does a when she does a gear too. Hang on. basically whistling on a on a word that's tough um it makes me think of when mariah would does that sometimes uh it's just we we can't talk about it all day but i wish i could um just this one time just deserves mass amounts of respect and deserves to be heard by more people that's all i gotta say track number six we have the beginning of side b and the one and only single this is a song i love too geronimo's cadillac Ooh, geronimo Hang on, I forgot about I want to hear that again. That was that was swift. That was swift. That's so pretty. Um, Okay, that was Geronimo's Cadillac, and I think it's very important to discuss um, that this is a cover, and I feel like the cover that it's by, uh, the, the guy's original name was, I'm sorry for the whatever the car that was out there, um, Michael Murphy, um, but the one thing is that I remember when I heard this song, and you hear that title, Geronimo's Cadillac, and you're like, Geronimo would not have had a Cadillac, but uh, what I find interesting is that uh, what he wrote here is saying, um, the two images together, Geronimo and a Cadillac, just struck me as a song title. It was every irony I could think of about our culture in two words, their attempt to make of him what would define as a civilized person. That was the reason they put him in a Cadillac in the first place. He was actually in jail at the time. Um, 
I think that, that that title is just so interesting. And the fact that this song in 1976 was like kind of saying like, hey, we stole the Indians land and now they they look where they got to go. They don't got nowhere to go. Um, it's very um, crazy. And like, it's, it's a thing that Cher, granted, you know, Cher didn't write the song. So we have to give a lot of credit to Michael here. But um, that Cher was like, you know what? I want to do this one too. And um, I've heard a lot of people say, um, that, uh, you know, that Half-Breed is a song, especially because we talk about that, that is not aged as well because, you know, here she is, a white woman uh, portraying the role of a um, Native American. And, you know, I think in 2020 that's a fair discussion to have, but I still think that it's interesting that she was telling that type of story in the 70s. Like, that she, like this character that she's portraying in this was born half-white, half-Indian. Everyone around her is telling her, you don't belong here. And she's like, where do I go? Um... You know, I think it's very important that she was saying these type of things, you know, putting the message out there, and especially with this one. Granted, she did not write this. Well, she didn't write Half Breed either. But um, I think that just the song itself, it, it's so haunting. But what's so crazy is that the chorus is so catchy. Like, you're like, oh, boys, take me back. It's so, like, I hate to say it, that it's fun, but I mean, I love hearing it. But uh, it has an important message to tell. I mean, it's such a good song. Cher, I've actually heard Michael's now, and uh, I like his too. Um, it's a great song, and uh, Cher delivers it perfectly. Okay, track number seven, The Bigger They Come, The Harder They Fall. I never realized the lyric here is when they tell me there's a pie in the sky. Okay. I mean, I guess I wouldn't be mad if there was a, you know, a nice apple or a pumpkin pie in the sky. Okay. Okay, that was the bigger they come, the harder they fall. And actually, I'm going to have to lend a lot of what I'm going to say here to the amazing... Also, I should shout this out again. It's been a while since I shouted him out on here. But uh, one of these comments I got uh, from the a few weeks ago, and trust me, like, I'm fine with it, but sometimes people are like, we hate you, you know, all that. You know, it's cool, it's whatever. But someone commented and they were like, we need someone who actually knows what the hell they are talking about to do these type of videos because I am sick of listening to you. And, uh, which I thought was funny, because, like, the purposes of reaction stuff is that a lot of this, I, I, I do my best to do what research I can, but going into a lot of these songs, I go in pretty blind, so I do the best I can. If you want a complete, cohesive knowledge of everything share, every album track by track, everything in itself, I really recommend you check out the Turn Back Time podcast hosted by Charlie Fern. He knows more than I could ever dream <laughs> <laughs> of knowing and uh i usually once i film a v episode or for my show my, my like i have a tv show here um or like i listen to one of these albums i always listen to his episode regarding that album so i can learn a little more about it afterwards with this album since i already knew it going in i was like i guess i can listen to it early so two things i learned from this is that this is a cover which was i think something i knew unconsciously at the time uh, by a guy named jimmy cliff and what i find interesting is that the song was originally just called the harder they come i'm assuming also maybe high and, oh, it's just called The Harder They Come. Um, which, But the lyrics are, the harder they come, the harder they fall. For some reason, when Cher was in the studio, they decided to rename the song The Bigger They Come, The Harder They Fall. However, and I didn't notice this until listening to it, they don't say, well, I learned that from him too, but just listening to it now, they don't say The Bigger They Come, The Harder They Fall. They still say The Harder They Come, The Harder They Fall. So I'm like, what was the point? I don't know. Um, but also, I didn't pick up on this until he pointed it out, but this is a, originally a reggae song. And I never noticed that until I listened to it today and after listening to his thing and I was listening for that and I'm like, yeah, I hear the reggae. So Charlie, thank you for that. This song is not, again, one of my favorites, but I like how she's like, um, until the day I die, I guess I'll just do whatever the hell I want. Um, and then the harder they come, the harder they fall. So meaning she might not necessarily get into heaven, but, uh. Um, that, that title, but there's a big pie in the sky, or there's a pie in the sky is interesting. Probably, I would argue, my second least favorite, or if we're going from favorite to least favorite, this would be my second least favorite. But then again, we still have to hear Rock and Roll Doctor, which I cannot remember how it goes, so we'll talk about that then and there. Curious about the name change, Sure, if you're seeing this, why, why the name change, but regardless, um, that's the bigger they come, the harder they fall. 
Track number eight, we have a song that this is Cher's first um, attempt. Well, it's not really an attempt because she exceeded, but uh, her first try at doing Love Hurts. Love Hurts. Okay, that was Love Hurts, uh, and let's be frank, the version on here I think is fine. Um, she does it better in the early 90s with the version that's on the Love Hurts album, and it was done definitively during the share at the Coliseum uh, version. That's to me the hands down best version of this you can listen to. Um, for it's fine. I do wonder why the last two minutes of it are just orchestral or orchestral. Um, uh, it's I don't I don't know why. I mean it's pretty. Pretty, I'm not gonna lie there, but um, I think just because she does it, you know, most definitively, uh, then it kind of makes this version kind of like a little oddity. But it is interesting that this specific song is one of only three songs she's ever re recorded, and that includes uh, You've Really Got a Hold on Me, Bang Bang, My Baby Shot Me Down, and this. Uh, th those three, it's kind of like okay, interesting, but um, yeah, I think it's just done definitively uh, later in the game. Okay, track number nine, probably one that I'm the most excited to listen to because I cannot remember for the life of me how this one goes. This is Rock and Roll Doctor. Okay, ah, I remember now. Okay. I don't know. I feel like I. like the sound of a shopping I Okay, that was Rock and Roll Doctor, and I did somewhat remember it, but this is prob- I feel like I'm- maybe I'm tuned out when this one comes out, because I would argue that this one might be my least favorite. It's the most jarring out of all of them, like, in terms of tone. It's a lot more in your face, I would say. Um, it's- what I- yeah. Maybe, because I've recognized this one the least, so I feel like it's probably my least favorite in a sense. It's good! It's very upbeat. I just feel it's at odds. I'm much more a fan of the- more, you know, melancholy parts of this album. This one's just a little too much for me at the moment. What I do find interesting, though, is that I never noticed this lyric, and I'm so happy I had the lyrics pulled up. There's a line here which is from Mobile to Moline, which mo means Mobile in Alabama, but to Moline, Illinois. Now, this is funny for me because I don't live anywhere near Moline, but back when I was in high school, so this would have been 2014, which would have most likely been just maybe a year after I heard this album for the first time, I traveled to Moline with a few friends to go see Demi Lovato at the iWireless Center in Moline, Illinois. Why? I don't know. Well, she was a big fan of Demi, and I was like, you know, I'll come too. Um, we had a fun time, but I remember specifically it was in October of 2014, and Cher 
was supposed to come to Moline for the Dress to Kill tour. She was going to come to Moline and then come to Chicago. And I had tickets to see Cher uh, for the Dress to Kill tour when it came to the United Center in Chicago. And as we all know, Cher had to cancel um, everything in the... Uh, uh, the end of the Dress to Kill, oh, it's still so sad. Um, and I never got to see her in the Dress to Kill tour, but I remember, you know how like in arenas, they have like a screen that goes around the thing and her photo kept popping up for the Dress to Kill tour. And I was like, I'm theater, not here, but I'm theater. So if anything, we got that little Moline reference out of that. So Moline, I, I honestly, the iWire listener was cute. Again, it's a different name now. I don't know what it is. Oh, well, while we're here, what, what, what is the iWireless Center called? I wireless center just because i'm curious it is now called the tax slayer ew okay whoever renamed it to that i don't know um so we'll just call it we'll always in memory is the i wireless center so there's that okay track number 10 the final track of the album this is stars we kind of end where we began in sound wise Okay, that was Stars. And I'm shocked, I forgot that this, um, I think I learned it some at some place, but um, that Janice Ian wrote this track. When I always think of Janice Ian, I think of Celine Dion in her Vegas show going, is these words written by Janice Ian? And then she sings her song at 17. But this song, uh, it's almost like ironic and like sad that Cher had recorded this because um, the lines, I mean, stars, people in the pop industry, they come and go, but Cher, now granted, I feel like at this time, because it was 1975, this album, you know, granted the album, you know, didn't really do as well as it came after that, but she was probably in a time of uncertainty, like, where is my career headed? Like, what do I do? Are people going to take me seriously? Like, what, like, what's the what? What's going on? Um, and she's, this song describes anything but her. Um, she has not come and gone. She's always been here and she'll always be here. She's done more than any of these people who are out right now could ever dream of doing. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's a very, uh, especially because the title of this album's after that, it's very telling of where she might've been in her head space wise, but as we all know, it all worked out rather well. Okay, so usually my policy for covering bonus tracks is that they have to be included on a legitimate pressing of the album. So because of the fact that this album has never been released, you know, officially, I'm going to give it uh, a little leeway because there are three tracks I have on the, on my version of it that um, I feel are important to talk about. They're not really a part of this album, but they deserve their due respect and this album deserves the most. So I'm going to go off of my, uh, my uh, rules for a little bit for today for just a couple of, sort of three songs. So before this album came out, she recorded a few songs with Phil Spector, um, 
which is, you know, the guy she was originally with was Sonny, and that's how she got her started career. And they recorded two songs, A Woman's Story and a cover of the the Ronettes, Baby, I Love You. But however, due to the expensive uh, use of studio time, the album was shelved. Now, I learned through the um, the podcast, the Turn Back Time podcast, um, and reading it now, I cannot believe I messed this up, um, that... Uh, this was before this album. So before these tracks were recorded, they recorded these. I thought that these came afterwards. Um, so that's my mistake for all these years. But that's crazy to me that the, they were recorded in early 1975. And this album came out in April 19th of 1975. So it makes me wonder like how quickly this album was recorded. But either way, we're going to listen to these two songs that never made it onto an official version of an, any album. But this is track number 11, Baby I Love You. Okay, that was Baby, I Love You. And this is a song, I've heard this before, like Cher's version, but I don't think I've ever heard the original version by the Ronettes. Um, but what I can gather is that I do know their one song, um, Be My Baby. So I can imagine what the original might have sounded like. I would gather that this is very different. Now, granted, I know some people, like, I know that Spectre sound, which is what we've heard Sonny imitate many times. Um, I feel like it, this is kind of different for both him and uh, Cher. Uh, because it feels like they've taken a song that's very rooted in that type of, like, motown ease, you know, 60s sound. Um, but they made it something much more different production-wise. Um, and I think it's kind of cool. It definitely, it could have worked on the Stars album. It could have. Did we need it? No. Um, but it definitely shows, like, a gap between Dark, or Dark Lady, that album, and between Stars. It feels like they're trying to work out trying to use the lyrics that they would use, but production changed it up a bit. So I admire it for that. It's an interesting little little single. So there we go. Track number 12, A Woman's Story. This one I'm excited to re-listen to because I've learned that it's not about what I thought it was about uh, thanks to the Turn Back Time podcast. So I really want to pay close attention to the lyrics. So this is A Woman's Story. I love this part. It sounds like so haunting, so scary. Okay, so A Woman's Story, um, like I said, I know I've listened to this before, but did I actually pay attention to it? Probably not as much as I should have, um, because I just remembered the haunting production of it. But uh, basically it's about a woman who is a prostitute at one point in her life, and she's done with that. She's found her man, and she's like, look, this is it. This is how it's going to be. I'm with you now. It's cool. But, like, there's just, like, this sense of uncertainty. Um, 
hauntingly beautiful. And granted, it's amazing to me that they would like kind of try and release these two as singles because they didn't really stand a prayer of mate being hits. But um, they definitely show a gap or like the br the the bridge between um the, the uh, dark lady and this album. I don't feel like the material on especially a woman's story is something that's tackled as darkly as it is on the official full star stars album. But a uh, massive respect to this one because I like how it deals with it. It's it's very haunting and it, you think about it and you're like ooh. Um, so I appreciate it for that and I actually enjoy it a lot more now. So I'm happy to appreciate and give w a woman's story a little more. A little more of a no knownness, if you will. <laughs> okay, track number 13, the final song we're gonna be tackling today. This is a just, it was a single that she recorded with a guy named Nilsson. I don't think I've, li I know I've probably, I I've listened to it before, but I have no clue how it goes. Um, this is a love like yours, don't come knocking every day. I remember this now. Wah, wah. in this from her I never realized give me a little bit of 60s vibes which is kind of like a nice little callback and not that I think they're bad but they kind of remind me a little more of that they're a little made <laughs> Okay, that was A Love Like Yours, Don't Come Knocking Every Day. And this song is fine. At first I was thinking, you know, production-wise, it could have fit onto stars if they really wanted to make it. But then the chorus kind of kicked in, and the chorus is just a tad obnoxious. So you're kind of like, never mind. Um, it's fine. N Nielsen sounds nice. He sounds very 70s. He really does. I don't know him, so uh, that's all I can really say to that. It's a little something of a song. Cher sounds a little tired at some points. Next! <laughs> Nah, it's not her best growly vocal, I'll say that. But um, it's fine, and I mean, I mean, if they ever reissue stars, I mean, that's welcome as a bonus track, so there's that. Okay, guys, we just finished Cher's 12th studio album, Stars. And in case you couldn't tell, I love this album. I feel very confident in saying that it's the best album from her from the 1970s. Um, the only one that I feel that I've really enjoyed as much so far uh, you know, going on my journey, um, is probably 3614 Jackson Highway and, uh, Bittersweet White Light. Those are my two favorites. So in terms of 70s, though, this one isn't beat just quite yet. Um, it, it, it's just filled with such great material, songs that just don't, they don't, they're not what you think of when you think of Cher, but because she's such a vivid singer and storyteller, they work. Um, the artwork of this is just gorgeous, especially the back two from this iconic photo shoot, my favorite Cher photo shoot. Not this photo, though, the other one where she's kind of like, Kind of like, not looking, but her, her fingers are out. That's cute. Um, this whole album is just so good. My favorite tracks are Bell Bottom Blues, These Days, Just This One Time, and Geronimo's Cadillac. Um, I love them. The ones that I'm not as big of a fan of are the more upbeat ones, which are Mr. Soul, um, Rock and Roll Doctor, and The Bigger They Come, The Harder They Fall. I would argue Rock and Roll Doctor is probably my least favorite, uh, because it's just the most different, I think. But in terms of the bonus tracks, um, I, I enjoy Baby I Love You, but I really just say I have massive respect for a woman's story. I didn't know that it was that hardcore. That woman had quite a story. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah. So if there's anything I really want you to take away from this video is that this album needs to be just much more respected. It could truly be considered Cher's best. 
Um, I just think, I think it's such a good piece of work and it is a damn shame that it has not been reissued on any form of uh, CD or digitally. I don't even think, let, bear with me for a moment here, but I'm almost positive. I don't even think, I think that the only other format this was released on was an eight track. Um, let's look at Discogs. So, so yeah, there was an eight track. Was there a cassette version? No, there wasn't even a cassette. That, that, that tells you a lot. Oh no, there was a cassette. I lied. But this, okay, according to this, there's one and it was only released in Australia and the, okay, there was a U.S. cassette release. Okay, fair enough. There was a cassette. So don't, the design of it though is hideous. If you could see what I'm looking at right now, that ain't cute. Um, and the only other thing that's ever done is that there was an unofficial, like I said, um, unofficial reissue on CD from, what is this called? I just said it. Um, uh, unofficial reissue, but there was a label that it said, um, I think it's on the back here, but lostdiamonds.com from Argentina, according to this. Um, so I'm happy that they were doing it, but I find, listen to this comment down here. It's from October 26, 2019. This is a CDR. They are not silver pressed discs. I am not against unofficial music for hard to find albums, but I want a disc that's pressed rather than data formed with color dye. CDRs are easily damaged. The manufacturer used a crappy phono cartridge and it shows. I ripped my own album with a micro line stylus and it's night and day. You're better off doing it. Well, that's fair too. So whoever wrote that skater eight bro feet, Okay, um, he's got a point. But it's all online, you can get it yourself. Um, but it deserves share. If you're seeing this, it, you gotta, come on. Come on. Put it on Spotify. Give us a CD reissue. Remaster it. Come on. It's time. It's time. It's it's 46 years. It's 46 years, Sherilyn. Come on. Um, Stars is an album that just deserves to be loved and heard. So if there's one thing I hope you get out of this, it's that. Thank you so much for watching this video. Um, means the world to me that we're in this era of Shara, of Sharon, <laughs> era of Sharon, era of shares now. I think we're just gonna keep on going. I will see you next week when we tackle, I believe it is, I'd rather believe in you. Am I correct? Yes, I'd rather believe in you. That's an album where I, I actually do own it, but I don't know any of the songs off of it, so that's good there. It's gonna be a little, a couple more albums before we get to an album that I know in full, so there's that. So what do you guys think of Stars? Let me know in the comments below. As always, do not forget to comment, like, share, and subscribe. Follow me on Instagram at Salvador J. Rocha, Twitter at Sal Says Stuff, and TikTok at Sal Rocha One. I will see you guys ever so soon. Have an amazing day. Remember, stars come and go, but you're a star in yourself, and you're never going or, well, you're, you're coming somewhere, but you're you're never going. I'll see you guys later. Bye.